Uh, with regard to Psalm 22:16, either Christians or Jews are lying or mistranslating this verse. This text either says, they pierced my hands and my feet, or like a lion, they are at my hands and my feet. I'm just trying to figure out who is telling the truth and who is lying. This is a very interesting question. The passage this person is referring to in a Jewish Bible will appear in Psalm 22, verse 17. In a Christian Bible, this exact same verse appears in Psalm 22, verse 16. It is the same verse. Let me read this text to you as it would appear in a Jewish Bible. Ki savavuni klovim adas mereim hikifuni, for dogs have surrounded me, a congregation of people who are wicked people, they have enclosed me, ko'ari yodai ragle, like a lion, they're at my hands and my feet. Who is that talking about? It probably is not very striking. You would probably have to know the context. It doesn't if you knew the context, it would be easy to understand, but if not, you might be confused. I want to do that a second time, as that passage would appear in a, a Christian Bible, a King James Bible. It would read something along this order. For dogs have enclosed me, a company of evildoers have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. That's what a a King James or NIV, a New American Standard, that's how they will, how that text will appear. Who does that sound like it's speaking about? Well, any person will immediately go, that sounds exactly like a crucifixion. That sounds exactly like it's speaking about Jesus. Whether you're a Christian or not, you have to go, who? They pierced my hands and my feet. That's very striking. That certainly sounds very Christian. It sounds like a crucifixion. How is it possible that I read to you the passage the first time and we really weren't sure who that was talking about and and I read it a second time to you, same verse, Psalm 22, 16 or 17, depending on which kind of Bible you use, and it sounds immediately very, very Christian. It sounds for sure, sounds like a crucifixion. The answer to that question is, that there's one word that has been mistranslated by the church. The last phrase of Psalm 22, 17 in Jewish Bible, 16 in the Christian Bible says, Ka'ari yodai viragle. The word ka'ari means like a lion. The ka is a prefix which means like. It's a common word in the Hebrew language, biblical and modern Hebrew. It's a, a very typical name uh, for a Jewish man. Uh, during George W. Bush's administration, his press secretary, who's still politically active, his name is Ari Fleischer, okay? Uh, Ari Fleischer, his first name, Ari, means a lion. So Kari means like a lion. Like a lion, they're at my hands and my feet. Now, imagine you take the word like a lion and you use your mouse and select them those words in so that these words are now white letters on a blue background in Microsoft Word. You hit the delete key and they disappear. And instead you put in the word they pierced and suddenly you have a brand new message. And that's what the church did. How do you change the word of God? As it turns out, the word Ari appears all over Tanakh. Ari, Ari, same root. It means a lion. Throughout Psalm 22, the speaker who is David, the author of this chapter, is not speaking about anything in the future. He's speaking about his own predicament. It's part of a, a motif that is that appears much earlier and continues through. That is that King David felt abandoned, that he felt his it was things were hopeless for him, that his enemies, and King David had many, many enemies. His own son wanted to kill him. His best friend betrayed him. His wife. King David had enemies on all sides. Ultimately, the very next chapter, David is still speaking and saying that ultimately God, the Lord is my shepherd, that God ultimately, even when I'm in the shadow, God is there. He comforts me. His rod, his staff comforts me. Okay. So King David is speaking in the first person about his own d desperate predicament. The reason why King David is so a person who is so loved, deeply loved, is because David 
despite these vicissitudes, which might otherwise spiritually break anyone else, David uh, remained strong and ultimately he remained, he remained faithful to God. And throughout Psalm 22, King David uses a motif of animals, of lions, of dogs, of bulls. And though that uh, poetic motif appears all over the text. In fact, if you go a little further, in the same chapter, Hashiani mi pi arie, save me from the lion's mouth. Save me from the lion's mouth. Well, when did lions attacking David? What lions is David referring to here? We go a little bit earlier in verse 14. Fatsu alai pihem, they opened their mouth. Arie tar v'shoeg. These texts are all speaking about lions that are attacking him, but they don't mean literally lions. It wasn't mean King David found himself in a circus, in a zoo, in the lions, then literally it means his enemies. The church changed one text, one verse, the one word, and suddenly the meaning of the whole chapter changes. Early Christian, no one believed these, these verses to be about, about somebody crucified. That is a later invention. And if you just change one word and then rip it out of context, you have a, a brand new message that sounds Christological. This passage is used very frequently by missionaries to convince you that, in fact, in the Jewish Bible, there's an open prophecy that, that the Messiah is to be crucified. This, if you, if you engage in any conversation with a Christian missionary, this comes, pops up so fast you won't know what hit you. But you might ask the question, well, how, how do you know I'm telling the truth? I mean, let's say you're not a Hebrew speaker. If you are, this is nothing I've said is revolutionary, intriguing. You go, well, I know what the word kari means. You, if, you, if, you, if your knowledge of Hebrew is not, is not great, just, just barely working, you'll recognize that word. But let's say you, you don't speak Hebrew at all. Well, how do you know I'm telling the truth? Maybe Rabbi Singer and the other bunch of his Jews who deny Christ, who are enemies of the Lord, they don't want people to believe in Jesus. So the Jews changed it. That means that this passage always said they pierced my hands and my feet. The Jews don't want you to believe in Jesus, just like in the gospel they're portrayed as the enemies of Christ and Christ killers. And what the Jews did is in order to hide the idea that the Messiah is to be crucified, they changed the words they pierced, a, a phrase that is completely unambiguous to like a line, which is very ambiguous, and you're not sure what it is unless you read it in context. And those Jews change it. You'll hear this a lot, although the term that the Jews changed it, people don't talk that way anymore, but you can be sure the church fathers, the, all the way to the reformers, all did. They all used terms like that. But how do you know I'm telling the truth? How could you be sure? How could you be sure? How could you lay your head down on a pillow tonight and close your eyes and be at close your eyes and be at peace that in fact that you are following the truth? Maybe the Jews are in fact the enemies of God and they change the Bible and pierced is the correct phrase. There are many ways that you can know this even if you don't um, even if you don't uh, speak or understand Hebrew. You're going, well, how is it possible? Well, I can't tell you, go to a dictionary, because maybe whoever did the dictionary changed it. I can't tell you to go to a Septuagint, which missionaries love to go to, because the original Septuagint was only five books of Moses, and it would be later Christians that would create, shape the current Septuagint that you buy on Amazon. Church fathers like, like origin. And therefore, the Septuagint that is accessible today is not from the hands of Jews before Christianity. You will be told this ad nauseum. It's nonsense. It's not correct at all. And if you look up the history of the Septuagint in my book, you can go online. Anyone, anyone who's knowledgeable will tell you the same thing I'm telling you. The original Septuagint was just the five books of Moses. Well, how could you really know? What does this word Ka'ari really mean? Kaf, Aleph, Reish, Yud. What does it mean? Well, all you'd have to do is you'd have to search in Tanakh where this word appears anywhere else. And today, this is very easy to do. In the old days, you needed a concordance. And these were big, thick books, and you'd have to at least recognize the letters. 
Today, you can really go online, you can use software, and you can look up where do we find this same word, and how is it translated other places? If the word ka'ari really means pierce, and not like what the Jews say, it means like a lion. So, it should be that if we find this word ka'ari somewhere else in Tanakh, and believe me, a term like like a lion, you would expect to find you do, it should be that all the places it, the word is translated as pierce, and only here the Jews changed it. Conversely, if the Jews would never tamper with their text, and in fact it says the word kari really means like a lion, what we do expect to find is if we search for that exact same word anywhere else in Tanakh, Tanakh is huge, there are, I think, 304,901 words in Tanakh, I believe, or 904. It's the order of magnitude is astounding. If we look in Tanakh, what we would find is we'd find that exact same word and all those other places, the Christian Bibles would translate correctly as like a lion and only here they translate as pierce. You got it? Someone is being inconsistent. Got it? Someone is not telling truth. This person is correct. Someone is lying. Now, it doesn't mean today today Christians are not to their fault, but they're fully, I'm going to use the word, and maybe I'll lose our brainwash. They're just told to believe this. But I'm asking the Christians watching this to take a moment and to research this a little bit. As it turns out, if we look up the word kari anywhere else where that exact same word appears, those same letters, Hebrew is a consonantal language, forget the vowels. Don't talk about Mesoratic text. It means we extract everything about a text that would make it Mesoratic. Got it? it? means take out the vowels, all the punctuation stuff. When we find the word... It's translated by the Christian Bibles everywhere else is like a lion, only here pierced. For example, Isaiah 38, verse 13. Isaiah 38, verse 13, Hezekiah is speaking, he's praying. He is discovered that he is set to die, and God is miraculously going to heal him. And he has a prayer that he says. The first words of this passage is, She visi at boke ko'ari. I want to give you a moment to look it up. Isaiah 38, 13, even if you don't read Hebrew, you certainly can recognize the shapes of letters. I don't speak Chinese. Let's say it's so far into you, but if I see a Chinese word here, and it just all I can see is the shapes of the letters, I can finally recognize that there are two words in two different parts of a book that are the two words that are the same, right? You can see that they're the same. Okay. So the fourth word, she visi ad boker ko'ari. The fourth word is ko'ari. I reckon till morning that like a lion. I'm talking King James translates it correctly like a lion in Isaiah 38, 13. The New American Standard translates it like a lion in Isaiah 38, 13. The New International Version translates Isaiah 38, 13 like a lion. Your Ukrainian Bible, Christian Bible, with a big cross on the front of it translates like a lion. Well, why does this exact word in Isaiah 38, 13 mean like a lion, but somehow only oh, here in Psalm 22, verse 17 or 16, depending, um, is translated as pierce. The answer is that it was altered only here, because Psalm 22 is a what is cherished in the church as the crucifixion psalm. And what the church did to is that it altered this specific verse, this specific word in this verse, so that it looks like it, the writer, the psalmist, is speaking about Jesus, is speaking about a crucifixion. Because there are many other passages from this psalm that are quoted in the Christian Bible. The opening of Psalm 22 it opens with the cry of dereliction. It's quoted in the book of Mark. Eli, Eli, Lama Azavtoni. And that's Picked up in Mark. Now, King David is speaking about himself, but Mark then puts those words into the mouth of Jesus in his version of Jesus' cry of dereliction in his passion narrative. There are seven endings in the Gospels of what exactly Jesus said at the end. This is Mark's version. So therefore, it would fit quite well. I want to raise another point which will be very meaningful to 
people who don't read or understand Hebrew, people who are completely illiterate in the Hebrew language, you certainly have to, whether you're, you embrace the Jewish faith, you're Jewish or you embrace the Jewish faith or you're a Christian, it has to be very frustrating to look on Tanakh as someone who doesn't understand Hebrew at all, know that the the Hebrew text is the original, it's the Word of God and have no access to it. I hope I can do something during this broadcast to convince you that it's a good idea to, it's worthwhile studying it. But I want to bring another proof for you that will demonstrate irrefutably that the church changed the text and the Jews didn't. And let me show you how, I'm, I'm going to show you how I'm going to do this. I want to review this point for a second. According to the Jews, I'm just going to use this kind of language for a moment. According to the Jews, Psalm 22, verse 17 in the Jewish Bible, again, 16 in the Christian Bible, says, like a lion, they're at my hands and my feet. Ka'ari yodai viragle, like a lion, they're at my hands and my feet. Our view is that Christians at changed it to read, they pierced my hands and my feet. They would, because it sounds like a crucifixion, they would then insert that alteration of the text and insert it into translations, which no Christian could read uh, the original. Almost no church father, uh, with the exception of some notable figures like Jerome and Origen, none of the church fathers were conversant in Hebrew. None of them were. So therefore, translations were everything, whether it was a, a, a Septuagint in the East, a Greek translation, or um, the Vulgate in the West. It made no difference, Greek, Latin, whatever it was. They were depending on that. The church goes all depending on those translations. So, our, what, what I want to convince you of is the following, that nobody in the early days believed that Psalm 22, 16 said, they pierced my hands and my feet. It, oh, everybody knew that it, the text said that like a line they're at my hands and my feet. And subsequently, Christians changed it. They oh, doctored. Who is an interesting question, but that's not germane. But Christians altered the text to, to read Christologically. Don't listen to the people talk about Septuagint. That's all nonsense. Now, Conversely, what do Christians say on the other side? What do Christians argue? They argue the verse. Listen very carefully, or you'll miss this point. The argument that Christians are making is that the, everybody knew that Psalm 22, verse 16, 17, slash 17 said, they pierced my hands and my feet. And at some point, the Jews changed it to read like a lion in order to mask the Christological message. You got that? How do you know? So I'll, I'll share something with you I've never shared on the show. As it turns out, if this verse was known to state, they pierced my hands and my feet, why is it that passage never quoted in the Christian Bible? Stop. Why in the entire Christian Bible, which is quoting from Psalm 22, before and after, why doesn't this verse ever appear in any of the Gospels? Why in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, letters of Paul, the crucifixion is incredibly important to Christians who are writers of the New Testament. Why isn't there a single author of the Christian Bible who thought that this verse was not important enough to quote in the New Testament? Think about that for a moment. In order for you to believe that the Jews are lying, this is what you have to believe. You have to buy into the following, that Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, whoever wrote those books, Paul, the epistles of John, Peter, and so on, they all knew that it said they pierced my hands and my feet in Psalm 22. But they thought that that verse wasn't important enough to quote in their writings. Does any sober mind, does any rational mind accept such reasoning? Every sober mind has to reject this completely. Do you really think for a moment that Paul believed that there was an explicit reference to the crucifixion in Psalm 22? And Paul is quoting from Tanakh all over the place, but he goes, not really, this is not so important. 
That's nonsense. That can't be. That's impossible. Paul would have quoted this up and down. Whoever wrote the book of Mark, Mark is essentially one big passion narrative with a long introduction. Mark, where the crucifixion is incredibly important. Mark went, oh, it's not so important. And the proof to you that it's very important is this is the one of the go-to verses, top three go-to verses that missionaries will use. Therefore, it is clear that there's no way in the world that the writers of the Gospels, if they believe that Psalm 22 stated, they pierced my hands and my feet. There's no way in the world that if Paul knew that in Psalm 22 it said, they pierced my hands and my feet, that he would have not quoted it. He would have quoted up and down. It's never quoted. That is never quoted. It only appears later in the, in the second century. Well, why didn't he quote it in the New Testament? The answer is that no one figured out how to molest the Jewish scriptures in the first century in this way on this particular passage, which proves only one thing, which points only one direction, that in the first century, during a time when the Gospels and the letters of Paul were written, nobody, Christians included, thought that it said in Psalm 22, verse 16 slash 17, that it stated, they pierced my hands and feet. No one did. And it was somebody who tampered with the text subsequently, and you can see why Christian, a Christian would, would, would stumble over this text, because Psalm 22 is very important to the church, would alter this one passage, that, and then it would subsequently read in Christian translations as, they pierced my hands and my feet. Why? How do you know this for sure? Is that it doesn't appear in the Christian Bible? Why isn't this quoted? This would be everywhere up and down. If you don't believe what I said, if what I said to you does not convince you, you should never listen to anything I say, you should never read anything I write, and don't listen to me, because that means that, that you're so in the camp of Christianity that no reasoning could could uh, make. That means you a priori believe in Jesus, believe in Christianity, and no matter what I would say, it would, it would be irrelevant to you. And what can I say? There are people who will just not allow any information that can possibly contradict what they believe. They will not allow it into their, their system at all. And in such case, you, you, I don't, I'm not saying this to be nasty. I'm saying it to make a point. You're completely excused. That means you're, there's, there's no critical thinking here at all. Now, uh, um, you are going to, again, be hit with the Septuagint. I want to ask you another thing. Now, as I mentioned to you earlier, the, what is called the Septuagint that is not the real Septuagint, this is not some conspiracy theory. I don't have it in front of me, but I'm sure if I looked on Wikipedia, Septuagint, everything I'm telling you was there. That the original Septuagint was the five books of Moses. You'll never hear that from missionary. They'll tell you the rabbis, 2200 years, nonsense. One other thing, I want to say this to you if you're a Christian. You're not a Christian, don't even listen to this. When someone says to you, well, it's in, the Sep in the, it's in the Septuagint, it may not be in Hebrew, the Jews changed it, we have a Dead Sea Scroll text from Nachochever, it's too far afoot of the subject, I cover that extensively in, in, chapter, in, in volume two of Let's Get Biblical, that there is no a fragment that says they pierced in Nachachever, which is a text later than, little later than Qumran, and Nachachever is an area some 30 kilometers south of, of, of Qumran in the Dead Sea area. I, just, I don't want that to, uh, to interfere with your thinking. I want to ask you, if you, you're a Christian in any way, Messianic in any way, and you're being told, well, actually, okay, so the original Hebrew text, or the, he, the text you would find in a Jewish Bible, is, is there something wrong with it? Is a Masoretic text, yeah, what does that even mean? Or is, but we have the Greek text, we have a Latin text, we have a, a Chinese text, it says differently. So, and therefore we follow that, because that's more accurate than the Hebrew. In what universe is a, is a, a translation superior to an original, not in mine. But I want to make another point that I don't think I've ever, ever expressed. If you became a Christian in your life, is this what you were sold on? Or are the rules shifting? When you became a Christian, when you can, got baptized, became a believer in Yeshua, whatever, however you want to 
however you want to convey that phrase, what were you told exactly? So this is how the, you were sold the car. You were told if you look at the Jewish Bible, the Hebrew Scriptures, Jesus is popping off every page. He is prophesied in the original Hebrew text of the Jews. It's there. For some reason, the Jews are blinded. There's a veil of the rice, whatever. But what sold you on believing in Jesus was that it's in the Hebrew. And then what happens is you finally encounter people who don't accept the Christian religion. And we, we show you that, well, actually, it's not in the Hebrew. There's a very, very, very serious problem here. And then all the people who converted you who were involved in evangelizing you or something, well, it actually is a Greek text. It's actually in, a, in some sort of Latin text. It's a, in a Chinese text. It's an Eskimo text. It's some other. It was the Jew. Well, that's not what I was told when I signed on to this thing. You were not told this. It's only later when you bought the car and you did it and you had all these things, you're totally invested in, you're married into it, and now your husband is this or your wife is this, your kids is this. No, they're telling you, well, actually, remember what we told you on day one? It wasn't exactly correct. I'd like you to think about that carefully. The reason the New Testament writers never quoted it because they all wrote during the first century. In the first century, no one thought of raping, molesting the text in this way. It was a later Christian invention. And I ask you, if you're not familiar with the Hebrew language, get familiar. But in the meantime, there's no time to waste. You can know for sure that the earliest Christians did not believe this, or they would insert it in the Christian Bible. No one would have believed it because this word appears everywhere in Tanakh, the word Ari, 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 all over the place, including this chapter, and it's translated as lion, only here pierced. Why? So you know the answer why. Anyways, thank you for that question. <laughs> בטרם כל יציר נברא ואת נעשה בחפצו כל אזי מלך, אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי כפלות הכל לבדו אם לא כנועה, והוא היה, והוא הווה, והוא הווה, והוא יהיה.